everyone welcome to the podcast uh my guest today is hugo and uh, i'm really excited to have him on he's going to hopefully help us demystify the hiring process and what recruitment teams are looking for he's uh, been in the game as long as me i had a look at his linkedin we went to university around the same time which is cool so he's got loads of experience so uh hugo do you want to just introduce yourself and uh, let everyone know what you do so sure thing. thank you anthony so thrilled to be here um this is my first ever podcast, so bear with me. Uh, fresh, no? I, I come from a design background, so I, I studied design at university at LCC in London. Um, I've always been a designer by nature. Um, photography has been a big part of my life. Illustration um, and graphic design is what I studied in particular. And I've also always had a passion for sales and working with people. Um, recruitment just came naturally to me. Um, and for the first couple of years I was working in IT, um, it was brilliant, challenging, but it wasn't really my, my passion. And, uh, I found a, an opportunity to join Salt, um, as a design recruiter almost 12 years ago to the day. And being 36 years old, I've spent a third of my existence in the same company. Um, I'm not sure whether to be, um, proud or concerned. Um, but either way, it's been an amazing journey. Um, my core focus subject area of um, recruitment is product design, user experience, service design, product management and leadership, um, regardless of industry, company size. Um, yeah, I'm the associate director here for that area of expertise. That's really cool. I mean, I turned 37 last week, so you're not that old. I've got a couple of weeks on you probably. <laughs> but uh, do, do you mind... Um... Okay, so a, a big thing is the market changes all the time. I mean, we've we've seen it go through peaks and troughs. Um, what's the market like as of today, October twenty twenty four? What what's going on and what and what's changed? Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is hard. It is very very hard out there. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this a long time, and I've never seen the level of challenges that we're up against now before. Um, I think there are, there are too many reasons to determine why, and that's why it's so difficult to navigate the market because in the past where we've had certain crises or, or circumstances that have taken place that have affected the market, we've been able to isolate them. Um, it's been COVID or it's been the housing market crash, or it's been Y2K, whatever it may have been, we've been able to put it in a box and find a way around it, over it, under it, or through it. Whereas now, the multitude of challenges that we're up against are so diverse and some are so close to home and some are so far from home, it's very, very hard for us. We come to terms with how do we work through it and how do we find the best way to move forward? Um, I think we've also reached a period of industry, particularly in digital and even more so particularly in product and user experience and design where we can no longer pretend. When I look back over the last decade plus, we have spent an awful lot of time designing and building products and apps and services that mimic other products and apps and services that sell mediocre services to an industry which, which wasn't necessary. We didn't need all of those things. And it feels like there's a shift now where the focus is now leaning towards on what do we need? And I think a lot of that came post COVID. Um, a lot of that came from the realization that the world can change in an instant. Consumer behavior can change in an instant. Our needs and responsibilities can change in an instant. And so I believe the focus now has, has changed direction for digital transformation, if you like. Yeah. So what, um, uh, I mean, it's been, it's been a crazy couple of years. We're, I mean, are you seeing any any growth in any? Is there are there any industries that are actually growing um, that that you're seeing people are asking you for roles within certain areas? Or there is growth. There's always going to be growth. The real question is the degrees of that growth. Um, I think so. Going back to the change in consumer behaviour, for example, people are spending a lot less money now on things they don't need. Yeah. And people are spending a lot more time thinking about what is important to me. 
Uh, it could be my family. It could be my health, my children, my future, my finances. I think there's a there's a far more um, better safe than sorry approach to life right now. And so if I was to look at areas where I'm seeing, where I believe there is growth, it's areas that are not only providing that better safe than sorry future, but they're also solving problems that are needed. Be that health tech, ed tech, envirotech, um, future city, transportation. Um, but then at the same time, right now, retail is busy because we're in peak season. So I've, I've never been a big fan of the question, which industries are growing? Because that can change month on month, quarter on quarter, year on year. I think it's it's a seasonal thing. It's an environmental thing. It's a cultural thing. Um, but yes, I, I would say that there is now more focus being paid towards how can digital impact areas of industry and business and services that are truly needed by people today. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you mention that because I guess that's kind of the core philosophy of user experience design, isn't it? It's what problem are you trying to solve and can you do that in the most user-friendly and simple way possible? That's kind of like always been the key to great products. And that has been like because of the boom in the last 10 years, uh, you have definitely seen products which are unnecessary and don't really, a lot of startups, they don't know what problem they're trying to solve, but yet they've got billions mm -hmm. invested in <laughs> into them. Um, so I, I guess what what I want to get out of this interview is, is your inside experience. So what what skills do you think people need to stay relevant and, and how, how do people stand out? Because one of the big things is we're seeing, um, especially for junior roles, I'm seeing like a job application online for a user experience designer and then I'm seeing 500 applicants on LinkedIn within three hours. And that, that's, that's mind-blowing compared to where we were five years ago. So how do you even navigate that world? Where would you even begin to advise people? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> so on the, on the skill side of things, I'm hoping to see, and I know there are many out there who are, who are fighting for this. I'm hoping to see us almost go backwards in user experience and actually start doing it properly again. One of the wonderful things about software is software enables us to cut corners. And the problem with cutting corners is at the end of the process, you've actually got a rubbish experience which your users can't use properly. And I think what's what's happened, you know, the good old days of, you know, Xur, Omnigraphle and Balsamic, I miss those days because you couldn't cut corners with those tools. They, they didn't give you the option. You, you had to do user experience properly. And so what I would love to see, and what I think is actually important, is the people who are looking to move forward in product design, if we can call it that. And we know that a lot of the 3D industrial diners, uh, designers are still offended by that title, um, and rightly so. But um, I think we need to focus more on real user-centered design again. I think the people who are good at that, but can also do the software, who are Figma gurus, um, or whatever, you know, title you want to give them buzzword. Um, I think a shift back to focus on real user experience process is important. And one of the things, one of the reasons I say that is accessibility is becoming absolutely paramount across products and services. In fact, I do believe that come next year, uh, Europe are imposing certain laws where if companies don't meet a certain standard of accessibility on their websites, on their apps, they will actually be fined, which I think is a fantastic thing. Um, so I definitely see a, a push towards accessibility. I see that rising. Um, the dreaded two letter acronym AI, um, it's no longer a cute idea. It is here and it's here to stay. And I think coming to terms with it understanding how it's used, understanding how you might actually be able to implement it into your processes and into your design skills could also be really, really important. Um, and then you asked the question, I believe, about you know job applications and huge numbers of people applying and how do we, how do we navigate that world? Well, there are 
there are so many ways to address that. Um, and I think you said, you, you mentioned, I believe earlier about being relevant and, and being seen, I yeah. suppose. So my, my favorite word for success in this current market is recognition. And if, if we're not seen, we're not heard. And if we're not heard, our chances are far lower. And I suppose my, my number one bit of advice in, in that department with, you know, the applications and the jobs out there is stop being just an application. Don't apply and hope for the best. Do apply, but do more. You have LinkedIn. You have the search bar. Search for that company. Figure out who you believe the hiring managers are going to be. Connect with them. Write to them. Introduce yourself. Showcase your skills. Make it personable. Make it direct. And make it make your application warranted, if that makes sense. You, you have the control to do that. And I think the vast majority of recruiters would agree that the people that we place the most often through advertising our roles, if it's not a, a headhunt or someone we knew to call, it's going to be the people who wrote to us directly, who were also an application and they were one of the 300, 500, 600, 1,000 applicants. But they took that extra 15 minutes to address me by name, to showcase their relevance versus the advert that I've put out. And they drew my attention towards and they created recognition. And I think that is one of the most powerful skills that people need to implement to their search today. Well, I mean, that's excellent advice. I mean, there's so many things I want to talk about, which you've touched upon. I think... I'll come back to job applications in a sec. We we could talk about that. Um, let's talk about skills and what what hiring managers are looking for within UX. And it's really interesting that you mentioned um, AI. So I guess my philosophy for the last couple of so I I also studied graphic design in university. So I I came into design from a very graphic focus. So I so my first jobs were designing magazines and taking those magazines and making them look like magazines on an iPad. So it was, there, there was no user experience involved. It was, take this and make it feel like a print magazine. And then over the years as I've been doing this, I've realized uh, more and more that the skill to great design is understanding what people want and what problems you're trying to solve. And it's, all, it's almost less and less and less about the execution. And, and I see that's where AI is... Um, is, is it's not a bad thing. It's making things faster. So, you know, we talked about um, Figma before. The, the thing that frustrates me is when people get into UX design, they just think UX design is a person sitting on Figma all day making designs. And um, it's it's not really about that at all. There's, there's many parts of the process. So from my experience, if you know the fundamentals of designing websites and apps, you could give a sketch on a piece of paper to a developer and they would build it and it would look great as long as you sat with them and told them what to do. Figma's not the output. Figma is basically instructions to give to developers. But the instructions that you give to developers need to uh, solve problems and they need to be useful. So just by making a website look great with flashy uh, images, animations, it's cool to do. And that's something that I definitely started off doing. But, but uh, as you work more and more in the industry, you realize that First of all, the flashiest websites don't always uh, solve business problems. They don't always make the most sales. They don't always do what you want them to do. You always need a website to do something, whether that's someone click to buy, whether that's someone to subscribe, they have a purpose. And you find that purpose out by doing real UX, which is talking to people, uh, getting ideas, testing the ideas with the people, and then they finally go into the Figma. So AI, I don't mind coming in and making the Figma a bit shorter. Because it's it's not it, it's the beginning bit that it, it can't really replicate at the moment, which is the most important thing. So I don't know whether you agree with that, but I feel like that might be something that people need to show more of in portfolios rather than just Figma skills. Actual, I guess, the user-centered design process bit where you're actually finding out what your problem is, who your target users are, and what problems you're trying to solve. Is that, I mean, I guess my question is, when you look, when because you obviously see loads of portfolios, do you do you see loads of portfolios with just Figma in? And do you always do you, I guess, prioritize ones that have a wider scope within them? Really, really good question. Um, I've got a few answers to some of the <clears throat> forgive me some of the things you've mentioned. So, the first thing is my least favorite portfolio to receive 
beyond the obvious, which is a link to a Dropbox folder of mismatched files, is actually a Figma portfolio. It, it is my least favorite. And th there's, there's reasons for that. The accessibility isn't great. Um, the usability isn't great. It's usually slow to load, clunky. We're not always on a great Wi-Fi signal. We, we, you know, a lot of people out there, those who are actually signing up the budgets, they don't know how to navigate Figma. Sorry, do you mean a, a portfolio made in Figma and they've sent you a Figma link? Maybe. Oh, I've never, I've never seen that. Oh, okay. I'm personally not a fan, but that's my personal opinion. So uh, I'm not right. really anyone who's done it. Cause some of them are done brilliant, but it's it's not my favorite. Um, I think just bringing it back to graphic design and kind of usability versus looking pretty. It always reminds me of my uh, graphic design tutor, Lee Clark. And I was designing posters. We were doing, you know, campaigns for social and, and uh, environmental issues. And his, his rule was the three-second rule. And he called it the three-second rule because it was a poster on the tube. So you're going up the escalator. And there's that line of posters going up the wall. And you've got three seconds to sell that service to someone. One, two, three, and it's gone. Yeah. And he said, it's all well and good, it being bright, colorful, and brilliant and drawing in people's attention. But at the same time, if they can't understand the message and they don't understand the service that you're selling and the product you're trying to put towards them, there's absolutely no use to it being pretty. And it was this kind of interesting approach to the balance between how good something looks and how well something works. And it's it's funny, that's always been it, that kind of, has stuck with me for, for years. Um, and I can't unthink it. And I apply that to portfolio. So for me, I think the, the, the one thing I would love to do is just once and for all end the debate. Do you need a portfolio? The only question is why wouldn't you have one? The problem with that debate is that people take the word portfolio too literally. You know, when people say portfolio, a lot of people instantly think an A0 black folder that you're carrying around outside Central, Central St. Martins in, in Holt and filled with paintings. That's not what a portfolio is today. Portfolio today could be, it should be a platform by which you can showcase what your skills are, what your methodologies are, where you've used them. And then some of the results of that use, and those results are your case studies, which should tell a story of ideally a beginning, a middle and an end. And there are challenges, you know, a lot of people are hit with really strict non-disclosure agreements. Um, sometimes there's a solution there to password protect. Sometimes the only solution is to explain what you did for that program of work without giving away any data or any critical or confidential information. But a portfolio doesn't need to be beautiful imagery. That helps because that's what human beings are drawn to today. We're drawn to the visual, the color, the bright, the engaging. Um, so if you can apply both of those, you can tell a story, show your value as an individual and within the team and show the result. Perhaps even give some stats. If you were lucky enough to see what the results of that project were, that's a wonderful thing too. I think the most important thing about a portfolio is that it's easily accessible. That's number one. Um, particularly from a recruiter's perspective, you know, when a designer sends you their CV and there's no link to a portfolio, it's, it's, it's a nightmare because I, I don't have time to wait. I can't email you, wait for you to respond, finally get the link. And then I've already got 17 other people behind me who are sending me their links. So I think, um, the real thing about the portfolio is there is no question they are incredibly important and incredibly valuable, but they, they are not what people assume them to be. Um, I actually had one of my senior UX researchers write to me just the day before yesterday to say, Hugo, I'm building my portfolio. And it made me smile because it was a researcher building his portfolio. And I can tell you now the amount of times that I've seen LinkedIn posts post and statuses from researchers saying, I would absolutely never need a portfolio and I shouldn't have to have one. It's not about whether you should have one or not. It's about why, why wouldn't you? It's, it's a wonderful way to showcase what you do. And it's not meant to tell the whole story. It's, it's the inside back cover of a book. That's why you buy the book because that inside back cover was so intriguing that you couldn't not bring that book home to read it beginning 
to end. So I think, so that's on the portfolio side. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really, really important. I've got loads of questions. I mean, I want to, I want to come back in a minute to graphic design, talking about, um, uh, beauty versus, uh, I guess story. Um, but just going to portfolios. So can you just give me, uh, I'd really like to know an insight of a hiring manager or a recruiter when you look at a portfolio. How many case studies do you expect to see on a portfolio and how long do you actually spend looking at the portfolio? And would you just look at one of the, would you look at the top case study? So do you need to spend more time doing one case study and then a couple of supplemental ones? And uh, just just give me an idea of what you look for when you're reviewing a, case, when you're reviewing a portfolio. Okay, so the first thing is, am I drawn in from the get-go? And, and I think anyone who says otherwise is, is probably fibbing to try and please people. When you land on a portfolio, you want to be visually pleased. You want to land on that portfolio and think, that looks nice. When you think about all the products and services that we engage with digitally today, we engage with the ones that not only work well, but are designed well. Um, unless we absolutely have to use a product that's designed badly, but that's not the intention here. So I think the first thing I look for is... Am I excited to be here? Are the colors interesting? Are the fonts good? Is the spacing good? Is it easy for me to understand how to navigate your portfolio? Is it is it simple? Um, simple doesn't necessarily mean to mean minimalist. I've been on, you know, um, one of my favorite designers is an avid skateboarder. I'm an ex. You can't see it, but I've got a whole plate and deck on the wall behind me. Oh, cool. uh, and his his. Well, it was designed in like skateboard graphics. So like crazy fonts and graffiti and all kinds, but it's still really easy to navigate. It looks wild, but it's easy to navigate. So that's the first thing I look for is, is simplicity through navigation. On the number of case studies, I don't think there is a right answer per se. I think what does happen is people misconstrue case study. A lot of people think that putting a brand name clicking on it, opening it to a bunch of images with a few lines as a case study. It's not. A case study is a study of a case, right? It's a case, the case being the project you worked on or the program of work and the study of that program of work. So it needs a beginning, a middle and an end. It needs a conclusion. It needs a reasoning. It needs your value add to that project. And one of the things I really like is when someone showcases their individual value as the consultant and within the team. I think it's really important to specify both because otherwise people draw assumptions and they might think, well, how much of this did you actually do? It's a silly question, but we're human beings. We can't help them yeah. cynical yeah. from time to time. Um, so I think the case study, if, if there was a sweet spot, I would say three to five as, as a sweet, but it is not a golden yeah. rule. It's not a it's, it's not the be all and end all. You may only have two. You might be junior. You might only have two. You might only have one. But if that one is really well presented and has brilliant context and it's easy to understand who you were within that project, then one, it can be enough. Five can also be great. I think there is perhaps maybe a too many. Um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily concern myself with that. I think yeah, I think so. So that's part of the thing. That's probably the main thing that I look for in a portfolio. Um, and is it um, one of the things that uh, uh, one of my designers used to do is he he used to he would have case studies as backed up files, and when he was applying to a certain role, he would manipulate the layout of his case studies on his portfolio. So he, he, he had clearly built his website and he was fortunate enough to be skilled enough to, to make those adjustments himself quite quickly. So if he was applying to an e-commerce role, he'd bring his e-commerce case studies to the top. If he was applying to a fintech role, he'd bring the fintech case studies to the top. And that's, that's a wonderful position to be in, to have that luxury of freedom to present, the, put the best foot forward for the roles that you're applying for. Um, but for the vast majority, I think Ease of use, no, ease of access, ease of use, clearly designed, tells a story, and ideally is visu visually appealing to some degree. Um, I think another um, 
analogy I like to use when looking at a portfolio is doing exams at school when you have to do a mathematics exam. And you know you've got that scientific calculator handy. And, you know, you can put the equation in and get the answer instantly. But if you don't show the working out, you don't get the marks. And it's the same thing for a portfolio. It's great to see the finished product. We want to see it. Of course we do. But how did you get there? How did the team get there? And what influence did you play in reaching that conclusion of that product or service? So, yeah, that's that's really important. Can I can I ask you like um, a, a two part question? I, I guess I'll, I'll ask you the first one. How how long do you actually spend looking at someone's portfolio? If I was to send you my portfolio for a job, how long would you actually spend looking on it? I'm trying to actually work it out in my head. I mean, it does depend, right? Because there'll be a portfolio. Well, it's good on bad, yeah. I'm not intrigued for engaged, and then I'm gone. But if I'm intrigued and engaged. I'm trying to imagine me going through the process in my head. I'd say minimum of three minutes. Sometimes, sometimes as far as ten, but very rarely. That's so a very complex lot. Uh, I've got an idea, and I want to ask you whether this would be a good idea in a portfolio. So uh, I know a lot of portfolios that people, well, I've done as well, is you have a written portfolio and it goes through. Like you said, like a science project, the hypothesis, the working out, the research, the designs at the end. Would you as a recruiter, if the person had the skills and they presented, like like imagine you're in a job interview and, and someone says to you, um, okay, tell me about your case study. If they recorded themselves presenting the case study and had it as a video or had videos of themselves, you know, instead of text, because we love to consume videos, talking about the case study, and showing their personality, because from text, you don't get any personality. Would you as a recruiter think that was any good? Absolutely. But again, how good is the video, right? So it's, it's this, everything can be a good idea if it's done well. And I know people who have done exactly that. I know, um, someone actually sent me their product design portfolio quite a few months ago. I wish I remember who it was. She had, um, her entire portfolio presentation was a video and it was so beautifully edited. She, she began the presentation as an introduction to herself. So you were met with her and then the screens would come up and she would be, you know, voicing over it, talking through the project, talking through her input. It was brilliant. She also had a static portfolio or rather a website. Um, yeah. but the, the video was just, it was amazing because you really understood, you you know, from the inflections in her voice to her style of presentation, her confidence around certain areas, her admitting a lack of confidence in others. It was just really, really clever, really, really clever. So, but it's not for everyone. You know, a lot of people, I don't like being on video. This whole thing is, you know, I've been chewing the fingernails in the morning. I mean, literally, I don't do that anymore. It's been a long time since I've done that. But, um, I'm, I'm not great on video. Um, I'm, I, I suffer from rosacea, so I turn into a tomato most of the time. Um, it's the nerves kicking in, but it's, it's not for everyone, but if, if you can do it, then great. And you don't have to put your face. Well, you could. can I just make a comment on the video thing? Let me, let me tell you my story about videos. So I, I, I got into YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, I, I took some, so I finished in Barclays and I took a few months off going traveling and I thought I need to, uh, I want to teach people UX. So I wrote, it's like a half an hour video. It's an introduction to UX. It's the first video on my YouTube channel. So I was, um, I was too embarrassed to present that video myself. So I've got Tourette's, so, uh, like just facial tics. So I, I don't like being on camera at all. I've always hated being on camera. Um, so I got an American voiceover artist to do that. And I, I edited the video. So it's my script, but someone else is saying, hey, I'm Anthony Gamboy, this is blah, blah, blah. And I, I've, always, um, I've always regretted doing that uh, because I... I feel like I was fake from the start and then introducing my own personality on my YouTube channel later became harder because I've got one video that gets all the views and then everyone's like, who's this Who's this Scouse guy on, um, on the videos? But as I started to do my own videos and they weren't as polished as the, um, as the official one and I've also done videos in a studio and I've done videos on a camera phone. So I've done high quality and low quality videos of me talking. I've also edited with, with screens on the top, spent hours and not. 
And because in YouTube it gives you the statistics, I found that just videos of me just talking like this do the best. And also I found a lot of people give me comments saying they actually much preferred me doing it because they felt my personality rather than just a voice over on a, on screens. But the more you do videos, the better and more confident you do become at them. So my first videos are terrible. And my new ones, I guess I just don't care anymore. I, I feel numb looking at the camera and talking like this. Um, and, th and that's also from university. We had to present, present our work every week. And the more, the more, I guess the more you do presentations, the better you get at them. And I guess my thing is it does make you stand out a little bit by having your, um, yourself on camera. Like you said, you don't like doing them, but you, but you're going to come across really well. I think you, you just look natural on it. And I think people feel like they look a lot worse than they actually do. Like I, I hated watching my first videos, but other people don't hate them. Other people like them because, um, I don't know if you've ever had an audio book by an author. And it's not them speaking it, it's someone else doing it. And instantly it's like, oh, uh, it's like, just just do the recording yourself. Um, That's very fair. No, I, I, I think you make a really good point there. And um, I think you, you're right that it's, it's about the authenticity of it. You know, when it's you with your personality, people are, event, they, they are going to prefer that to the voiceover. In, in, in the very same way that when you're watching a, a, a reel on Instagram, which hopefully we're not doom scrolling too much, when it is that fake robotic voice over the top, it just doesn't feel the same. It, it feels empty. It feels void of meaning or emotion. And so you're not as bought into the story as if it was the person in the story telling the what's So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think if, if people are confident enough to bring that to portfolios, then then amazing. And if not, I'll be it. There's this... Yeah, I mean, it was a wonderful way to stand out. It would definitely. I mean, that's just my theory because if a hiring manager was to look at it, it almost gives you a step up in the interview because they are, they know who you are before you get to the interview. They've got an expectation of you. They've already met. Essentially, yeah. 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 So uh, I guess that's that's uh, that was it. so. Go on. What what else would make people stand out? Is there anything other than that? That um, I think we've talked about. So portfolio aside, portfolio aside. Bringing it back to recognition, um, I won't tell the full story because a lot of people know it already and the people who are watching this probably do know it, but um, I was having a conversation with someone a long time ago and we, we ended up coming up with this saying, if you like, where consistency creates recognition, recognition creates trust, and trust creates commerce. In that if you see something regularly enough, you'll learn to recognize it. If you recognize something well enough, you'll learn to trust it. And if you trust something, you will spend money on it. Apple is the prime example. Um, you know, if any of your Apple products break, the first thing you do is you book an appointment at the Apple store, which can take hours to do, days before you get your appointment. It can take ages when you're in there. You can Real, you probably realize you, you, your Apple Care's run out or you never bought it in the first place. And then, you know, you've got to pay out your backside to replace your product or get a new one or whatever it may be. And ironically, that entire process could have been avoided if you'd gone within a few mile radius of the Apple store. There are independent hardware and software stores where the individuals there have the exact same skill set and they would see you the same morning and they would price match or better. But we don't go there because we don't know them. We know Apple well enough that we recognize them. We recognize them well enough so we trust them and because we trust that we spend money on them. And it's the same thing for us. I think where I'm going with that is a lot of people looking for work now still see themselves as an individual or as an employee looking for a job. And I don't think that's the right mindset. I think we need to look at ourselves as a brand made up of a number of products and services and we need to look at our future employers as our customers. We need to be selling ourselves to, as our audience rather. We need to be yeah. selling ourselves as a brand. Uh, selling ourselves could be misconstrued. Um, so I don't mean it um, quite that crudely. It's presenting yourself as a brand, uh, isn't it? Yeah. It's presenting yourself as a brand. And there, there are numerous ways of doing that. Consistency. You know, the, the amount of times that I receive a CV that that does have a design nature to it. It's got color, it's got content, you know, it's got attributes to it that make it a design CV. But it in no way shares 
commonality with the portfolio, which in no way shares commonality with their LinkedIn. And so I think creating a consistent brand is really, really important. For me, it's just my bloody profile picture is this yeah. on every single platform I use to communicate. My Instagram, my WhatsApp, my LinkedIn, my Notion, my Outlook, my Google. It is all the same. The, the, the photo is identical. And so eventually people have seen that pink circle with my silly face in it and they've gone, oh, that's Hugo. Oh, there he goes again on that platform. And it just, you learn to recognize these things. It kind of gets imprinted. And designers can do the same. But I think what's really, really critical, particularly today more than ever before, is aside from the obvious, having a well-constructed CV, having a strong and well-built portfolio, having a good LinkedIn profile, and let's not pretend LinkedIn's not important because it is absolutely critical. Because it is, it is the God platform of career trajectory. When yeah, I was having this conversation with someone recently and kind of we, we kind of came to the conclusion, when you think of any major product and service that you have, that you use regularly, you can be damn sure that there are at least one, if not multiple, direct competitors to that product and service that you love and that you use, right? Whether it's Deliveroo and Uber Eats, whether it's Monzo versus Starling, whether it's Apple Music versus Spotify, whatever it may be, they all have immediate competitors. LinkedIn doesn't have one. No one is even close to touching the sides of what LinkedIn is and what it can do and what it's capable of. And so if you've got the products, your CV, your portfolio, your services, the skills you have, if you have all that and you've got that brand identity and you've given it some thought and some some personal color and, and, and texture, then the really important part is integrating with your community, is actually being a member of it. And that doesn't mean you have to be a podcaster. It doesn't mean you have to be an influencer. I'm not, and I probably never will be. It's just about connecting beyond a thumbs up like button or a that's awesome dude comment. Make it meaningful. Um, connect with people, challenge their ideas, thought share, um, really build a community around you because I would not have been at Salt for as long as I have and had the successes that I've had if I hadn't just thrown myself in. Yeah. Um, and some of the relationships I've built are, are, are a decade in now and they'll last forever. Whether I remain a recruiter forever or not, uh, some of those relationships will be will be forever relationships. And I think a lot of the success that I've had over the years has been through what we call passive recruitment. I haven't gone looking for it. It's come to me through social influence, if you like, through being a part of the community and actually taking the time to get to know people, understand them. Um, and then there's also the manipulative side of it where you can use the algorithms and the analytics on these platforms to your advantage by posting every day, which I don't do. Um, but you can piggyback, you know, you uh, find the big influencers out there in design when they post something thoughtful, when they post something interesting about a new piece of software or a new methodology or a new industry or Tesla's done this, comment on it, but don't just say that's cool. Open question, start a conversation, create a thread, you know, be, be active and, and a part of the community that, that you work in. I think that's, that's really, really critical. Because you could have the best portfolio in the world, the best CV ever. You could be the best product designer or UX researcher or service designer or ethnographic genius that exists. But if no one sees you, if no one knows you're there, you're making it a lot harder for yourself. So I think it's, it's two part. It's what you have to offer and how many people know you have that to offer. I think that's, that's really, really important. I think you made some really good points. So um, I guess one of, one of my pieces of advice is on, on, on LinkedIn or other platforms. So I've been doing um, a Python course, and I'm kind of in there, like, I'm not a coder. I've never, I've never really been uh, good at it. But I'm kind of interested in, as all the new AI tools are all built in Python, and my kids are going to school and they're going to learn Python, it's like, right, I need to figure out what this stuff is, so I'm doing a course. But I've been sharing on LinkedIn kind of like little bits of code I'm learning along the way. It's like, oh, today I made... Um, 
Python do a calculator or something like that. So I feel like even, and some of those posts get the most um, reception on LinkedIn because there's so much trash on there. So many people posting about SpaceX, so many people posting about whatever today's daily topic is, and then posting a random poll on it, which when it has nothing to do with their field. So it's like if you can, um, I guess, add some value and teach people stuff. Like I'm, I'm terrible at Python, but I'm better than 90% of people because they don't know anything. <laughs> so it's like if, you, if you're along your journey, especially juniors doing UX design, what are they By the way, yeah, I mean, it's like if you've spent a week doing design. You've, you've spent a week more than most people on the platform. So and most people are beginners. So if you can teach them, okay, here's, this is what a font is all about and this is why you shouldn't use Comic Sans for your brand, then I feel like that's part of the personal brand. And it's, you don't need to be an expert. You need to share interesting content. And so so that's kind of like... Um, there is there is a lot of noise on LinkedIn. A, a, an incredible... It makes you laugh. And it, well, it, it does until it makes you angry because <laughs> um, a, a lot of it is what I just call clickbait. It's, it's, it is there to manipulate the analytics. Um, and so when I, whenever I've said to people, become a part of the community, get on LinkedIn and, and share and get involved and, and communicate, find your voice, find your way of doing it. You don't have to be like everyone else. You don't have to to do the stuff that's cool or trending you need to find a way to be authentic kind of bringing it back to the video right yeah that the the, the clickbait posts on linkedin are no different to the professional voiceover on your original video it's a great video maybe to some it might have something in there but it wasn't you and it wasn't authentic and so that's why it bothered you in the same way that this content on LinkedIn bothers me because it's not authentic. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm an opinionated chap. Um, I think most would agree. Um, and so that's, that, that is my voice on LinkedIn and I've chosen to, to do it that way. So when I see someone post all UX UI designers have bastardized the industry, I will challenge that because it's absolute nonsense. Um, or product designers are pretending or... You know, there's there, there is a lot of um, there is there is a lot of angst on LinkedIn. There's a lot of waffle. There's a lot of empty content. And so I think finding your voice and and trying to fight the good fight is 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 a great thing. And you're not going to please everyone. That's just the world, right? I fifty percent of people are going to hate me for what I say. Fifty percent of people might like me for what I say. And that's fine because that's the fifty percent that I want to work with. So you don't have to be. You, you can't please everyone, so stop trying. And I think that's what a lot of influencers do with their content is is they try to please everyone so the content's empty. It doesn't have yeah. meaning anymore because you're just sitting on the fence. There was a wonderful post by one of my senior UX, uh, UXers the other day who I've known for many, many years. And he was really infuriated by something. And he asked the question, you know, have I been too harsh in my review? And, and then he put, then he asked AI to deliver his review as AI would do it. And the first thing I said to him is, you can't be too harsh in your personal feelings towards something because those are your personal will see your complete. Second thing, AI version of his review was a hundred words long, exactly. It was really odd. And it didn't mean anything. It didn't give an opinion. It didn't give an answer. It didn't have a right or a wrong or a green or a red or any real thought-provoking feeling it was just I, I had, it was just sat on the fence it was really really odd and um i think that's a really important part of how we behave today is let's we, we need to be as authentic as possible because it's the only way we can stay above ai is our well, authenticity I, because it, i think i I think two things in it. So first of all, I think it, it, it takes bravery to be authentic. People people don't mind posting what AI put because it's official and it's like, it's it's, it's not them in a way. It's They're just sharing something. Like, and as, as more and more people use AI, more and more people's content and tone of voice, resumes, CV, portfolio descriptions, they're all going to sound exactly the same. You're gonna, you're gonna, we're going to get used to reading this AI waffle 
and be arrogant like using sophisticated words it's using and you're going to be like that is not a person's tone of voice that is generic ai waffle so uh, i like what you're saying about having your own um, almost personality it's like develop your tone of voice develop it unique to you how you speak how you want people to perceive you and um the key to all of this is whoever has the i guess the best brand and the, and the, the audience is the key because when you have an audience you'll find jobs easier you'll be able to sell products that you promote easier you'll you can do whatever you want getting the audience is the key and you develop yeah. that by a uh, personal branding um so i just want to loop that back around so one of the, one of the things is I'm actually quite interested in demystifying the actual uh, res the application process. So what's your part in it? And because I know a lot of people get jobs not through applications. So you see this application there's a thousand applicants, but but not all the jobs are placed through that. They have like people like you recruiters. You go out and get people. How how does it all work? You've been more ambiguous, Anthony. No, I'm teasing. Um... It's, I suppose it's kind of, it's a part of everything we've already discussed and, and then some, I think right now there are more people, it is a cat, it is, it, 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 there are a lot of people looking for work. There are an awful lot of people looking for work and in order to, I mean, when you say demystify, I don't think there is any mystery anymore. I, I, I feel like mystery is kind of gone because everything is in the public space. Everything is is presented to us. You you can't hide behind anything anymore, particularly as a recruiter. You know, we are the first to be reprimanded uh, publicly on LinkedIn for, for any foot we put wrong, um, which is fine. We're used to it, the most of us. Um, I think... I think the mystery is designers, if, if we are looking particularly here at designers and design talent, they're amazing at selling the products and services of their client. And they're terrible at selling themselves most of the time. And on top of that, with the challenge of the market, it's about finding what's valuable to you so which recruiters do you bond with? Who can you build a real, candid, transparent relationship? Who can you trust? Because it's very difficult to trust people today because a lot of people are desperate and desperate times don't often lead to trustworthy times. They lead to quite the opposite. So if I was on the market now as a designer and I was trying to wrap my head around the mystery of how do I find a job? How do I work through this, this world? My first port of call would be to treat myself as a client. I am now working as a designer on myself and myself is that product and service that I need to sell. So I need a brand. I need to work through my products and services. What do I have to offer? How can I best present them? So I'm going to have a strong CV. I'm going to have a portfolio. I'm going to have a LinkedIn profile. And I'm going to get everything together and, and build that entire omni-channel service. And then once I've got that, then I'm going to use that to go forward to the market. How do I do that? I focus on where can I add value in industry? What am I passionate about? What am I going to do well and who am I going to do it well for? Because if I'm, you know, a very strongly moral person, me applying to British American tobacco is probably not a good idea. But if I'm desperate, I might. So it's it's one of those things where we, we just, I think people need to be true to themselves right now. And by that, I don't just mean true to what they want to do for a living and who they want to do it for, but also true to themselves. Are they actually really doing everything they can to make this a success? Because just by clicking an application on a LinkedIn job advert isn't enough anymore. It's not enough. Um, it's harsh to say it, but it feels like we, it kind of feels like we're in Kruger National Park right now. And it's survival of the fittest. You know the video of the lions, the the crocodiles, and head world of beasts. It was just the most purple I've ever seen in my life. But that's what the market feels like right now. We have to be faster, stronger, better, more relevant, more apparent, 
more presentable. We, we, we need to be the best versions of ourselves we can be in order to, to get what we need, not even what we want, just to get what we need. Um, and so find yourself a few good recruiters. Do, because they will, they will sing your successes from the rooftops. We are your cheerleaders, right? That is what we do. When we go into a business, we don't just send your CV and hope for the best. We do absolutely everything we can to convince that hiring team that you are the right person for that role. Now, yes, we're not going to do that for just one person. We have to do it for three to five. That's the nature of the game. And, and that will never change. Although there have been a lot of cases over the years where I have just sent one person to a client and they have gotten the job because you just know that they are perfect culturally, character wise, skill set wise, exposure, industry wise. So, gone on a bit of a tangent there. What I really mean is to work through this. Put your mask on first, right? The rule of being on the air. Do you have everything in order? Are all your ducks in a row in terms of what you're going to market with? Are the recruiters going to have everything they need when you, when you reach out to them? Are they going to have your CV, your portfolio, your case studies, your entire online professional presence? Is it all there for them to access easily without too much trouble? Great. Once you've done that, go to market, go to LinkedIn, find the clients you want to work for, connect with those hiring managers, write to them directly. There's nothing to prevent you doing that. Absolutely nothing. Um, be present. Talk about who you are and what you do. You don't have to show off. If you don't feel comfortable talking about your successes, you don't have to. If you don't feel comfortable talking about yourself at all, you don't have to. You can talk about the industry. Just engage. Engage with as many people who you believe are a part of your world and can help you through it. Whether it be them directly helping you and offering a hand or just being present on your profile and having that analytics jump through a thread of conversation or whatever it may be. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if any of that makes sense or helps. No, I, I, it does. Can, I, I think I think I think I'm going to try and summarise this. By I, I'm going to go through an action plan, and you tell me if this is good. So I'm, I'm going to pres, I'm going to presume tomorrow I need to go and find the job, right? So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure I've got a portfolio. I'm going to do some case studies in it. I'm going to, I'm going to do three really good case studies about the work I've done. Um. And I'm and I'm also me. I'm also going to do some videos, and I'm going to put them at the top because I know people like to watch videos. And I'm going to put my personality within the stuff that I do because I think that's how I'm going to stand out in this AI world. I'm going to get a, a, a decent resume, and I'm going to make all my brands match. LinkedIn, like you said, with the pink circle, your face. So mine's like a green. I, I kind of copied off you. I've got a green circle on my face. So choose your color scheme, choose your brand, graphic design, get your LinkedIn. If you want to do videos, I, I think sharing stuff on YouTube is also good. Um, so you've got your resume, your, 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 your portfolio, your LinkedIn, and your other social accounts. Then I would, every day, I would start sharing to, to you said they use the, I guess, the algorithm. YouTube likes it when you uh, produce more LinkedIn. These, these platforms like it when you put stuff on them effectively and they'll push it out to more people. And so I would start sharing unique, interesting things that wasn't written by AI. Like stuff that you actually like and are interested in, then I I think I would probably find some recruiters I wanted to work with, like like yourself. I would find recruiters in the industry. Like if I wanted to work for a big tech company, I'd have a look for the the biggest tech recruiters in the country. I'd reach out to them personally, give them a call, introduce myself. Um, so I've always found recruiters that they love calling people. And that's that's what they do a lot. That's what they do a lot. So introduce yourself. Um, make those connections and then I would probably go via those recruiters for the jobs once I had my brand ready and um, everything in order. Does that sound like an actionable plan for people? It does, yeah. I think, I think what's, what's really important is, is, to just, is for people to know that there isn't a one row ticket. It, it, it needs to start with you. Then you need to go to market. And how you choose to do that is entirely up to you. Um, you may not like recruiters. Fair enough. Um, don't use them. Go your own way. You can recruit yourself. You can sit down 
draw up a list of all the companies that you want to work for or the industries that you're passionate about. You can then quite easily, if you like, through ChatGPT, you can literally ask it the question, which are the best companies to work for right now in health tech? Which are the most invested companies right now in EnviroTech? Which are the most exciting EV companies right now? And it will give you those lists. And then you jump on LinkedIn and you find those companies. You find the hiring managers that are relevant to you. Be it a CPO, CDO, head of UX, chief of experience. And you connect with them and you write to them personally. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that. And I think if people did that more, um, it would just create we, we used to have a really buoyant market and there are a lot of reasons why we don't now today and we obviously do not have time to go through those because they are many and they are vast. But I feel like a lot of the confidence that we had has, has, been, has been damaged and I think people need to put, them, put themselves out there more in the way that they feel comfortable doing it. If you're a video person, great, go and do it. If you're slightly more reserved and more shy and you don't feel comfortable doing that, then reach out to people directly who have said something interesting or who have shared something interesting or find the middle ground and comment on those posts. Create some noise. Let people know that your brain is in this game too and you've got an opinion and it counts for something. And you, you can challenge that subject matter or you can agree with it or you can share your own personal story. I think it's about having your products and services in order, finding your voice, using that voice and your brand to make sure that you're not forgotten and that you are a part of this community of product and design and user experience. And that can only better your chances in, this, in, in the job hunt. And then you can do those targeted things yourself. You can find the best recruiters for you. You can find the clients you want to work for. You can reach out to them directly. Um, just just stay up to date, stay relevant and be present. I think that's that's the most important things. I, I think honestly, I think that's the best place to end it. I, I I think I really hope people have got something from this. I think Hugo's advice is invaluable. If you've got any questions for us, I'll I'll leave our LinkedIn's in the description. And uh I just want to say thanks to Hugo. I really hope that your first podcast has been a, a positive experience. It's been over a little and I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't waffle on that. That I broke that promise quite a few times, I believe. But um, yeah, I, if it is, yeah, like this is my first time, so the nerves were like, Oof. Um, probably shouldn't have had a giant coffee before. That. But yeah, no, it's been amazing, and uh, th th thank you for challenging me as well. I really had to think about some of those questions and kind of work out how I would, how would I approach them, and uh, and also just being true to myself and being honest in my answers because I I didn't want to to sugarcoat anything or. Or feel I was just giving people what they were meant to hear. I, I wanted to give people what I, I genuinely believe to be important now.